Hi, I'm Phil Noble, and we're at the College of Charleston with Walter Alessandrini, a New South Carolinian by way of Italy and Colombia, an extraordinary businessman and entrepreneur. Welcome to Envision. Thank you very much, Phil. Glad to be here. You, you had a, um, a, a recent huge career in Colombia, and I, I have to ask, how'd you get to Colombia from Italy? Well, that was a dream came come through. <laughs> Obviously, if I didn't know much about uh, South Carolina when I grew up in Italy, uh, I, I like to say that I'm Italian by birth, American by choice, and a South Carolinian by the grace of God. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Right. Um, it, it's I um, at some point in my life after coming to the United States in California first, and then I went to run a company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this company had uh, a plant in Baseball, South Carolina. So I started to travel here to the plant many times, many visits, and uh, I started to fall in love with the state. Uh, people first, uh, the beauty of the states, and, and all the beautiful things that you can do here. And so at some point, since we were growing and we needed to expand, we decided to move the headquarters of Union Switch and Signal from Pittsburgh to Columbia, South Carolina, and that was uh, 21 years ago, and I'm still here. You're still here. Before you came to South Carolina, what, what was your impression? What did, you, what did you think of the state before you first came? Uh, I didn't know much uh, except for some, obviously, history books or Gone with the Wind, you know, Charleston right, right. and so on. And uh, uh, I got to say that the very first time I went to Batesburg, uh, I looked around and I said, who in the world would want to put a plant here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then as I started to, to know the people, the, the, the plant, uh, uh, you know, uh, we really turned it around in doing extremely well. Uh, I started to know the people, the workers that we had there, and the people in, in the communities of Colombia and, and, and South Carolina at large. Uh, then uh, I really started to see the qualities of the state. And how big was the Batesburg plant? The Batesburg plant, I think, when uh, uh, I went there the first time, was about uh, 200 people, and they doubled over the years. And Union Switch and Signal made essentially technology for railroads, right? For railroads and for metro transportation systems, yes. And it was, it was owned by an Italian conglomerate, right? Yeah, it used to be owned by American Standard, uh, actually, and uh, uh, Italy, Italian Fim Meccanica and Ansaldo bought it from uh, uh, American Standard. The uh, company was not in good shape. Uh, we turned it around in about a couple of years. And then in '93, we actually took the company public and uh, expanded it through acquisitions uh, to become really a world leader in uh, railroad and transportation technology. And how long after you took over the company did you decide to move the headquarters to Columbia? So I, I went to Union Switch in uh, mid-88, and uh, by mid-92, we uh, the headquarters uh, were moved to Columbia, South Carolina. Were your colleagues in Pittsburgh going, what are you doing? Why are you moving from Pittsburgh to Columbia, South Carolina? Of course, there were some of that, <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, also because, uh, you know, at that point, we really, uh, since the business was starting, we divisionalized uh, the business. And there was a division of uh, the systems division of the company that made a lot of sense to keep in Pittsburgh also because we had... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, work done together with the Software Engineering Institute or Carnegie Mellon and so on. But uh, one of the biggest advantage of uh, being in Colombia with our global headquarters was that we were a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond than in Pittsburgh. And we got a lot of attention, a lot of help. And that was also, uh, you know, the tremendous response that I got by moving here. Everybody wanted to help us to be successful. And they opened doors for us uh, worldwide, and, and it, it, it was just much easier uh, to operate in the global scene from South, from South Carolina than actually from Pennsylvania. That's fascinating. I, I want to come back to that global operation, but, but after you left, and you were, you were with Union Sw Switch and Signal, and then the company was sold, right? 
No, no, you knew Switch and Signal, uh, still, it's still uh, yeah, it's still part but, but of Ansaldo. You, you, you went from there to... Well, actually what happened was that uh, uh, Pirelli was interested in a CEO for Pirelli North America. Uh, Pirelli North America is also a quarter in Columbia, South Carolina. I was contacted by a headhunter. We started to talk and uh, it was an excellent move and uh, very easy to do it. I just had to, you know, change address. Change your, <laughs> yeah, change to go your from route home. to work every That's day. That's right, my community, yeah. yeah. And how big was Pirelli when you... Uh, Pirelli, at the time I joined, and that was in 96, it was about a half a billion dollar company. Uh, by the time, and, and uh, losing money, and by the time I uh, left Pirelli after two and a half years in 97, it was about a billion dollar company and very profitable. And people think of Pirelli as tires, but that's only a small part of what right. Pirelli. Right. The, 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 the biggest business at the time was really the, the cables and system business. And, uh, uh, you know, Pirelli started with power cable, building the insulation for the power cable for the copper, and then moving into uh, telecom cable, fiber optic cables. And they are a bunch of very brilliant physicists and engineers. They started to develop photonics, which was the first light amplifier, right. uh, and, and things like those. So we became involved into the, the photonics business. Uh, how to put more information into a strand of fire or fiber in a cable. And then because of that, uh, I was contacted again by some uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley who offered me to go and run a startup that they had in, in the photonics business. And uh, what was the name of the startup? Avanex. Avanex. And that went from startup to... That <laughs> those were a that, sign. That was, a, that that was, was uh, <laughs> it wasn't a straight line, right? No, that was a sign of the times. Uh, and, uh, but the, the credit that I, that I take is uh, uh, understanding that, that, you know, it was a unique window and really pushing uh, pedal to the metal. And so that was, uh, it went in 42 weeks since I joined the company from being a little startup without an order, without a customer, without a shipment. And after 42 weeks, we were a public company, initially valued $10 billion, and then going from up to $16 billion. From startup to $10 billion in 42 weeks, mm -hmm. and then the world changed. Then the world changed, but uh, uh, you know, by virtue of the fact that we were uh, really, we went very fast in that position, uh, the company is still there today and yeah. is still doing well. Uh, we were able to raise cash that then was invested in development of new products, marketing. A lot of companies, uh, and we had a lot of competition there who were waiting longer, they are not there any longer. So yeah. it, was, uh, it was a good move after all. <laughs> and you have, as you said to me earlier, you have retired several times but keep flunking your retirement and coming back and starting to get involved again and back in business and talk a little bit about your the why you decided to get involved with South Carolina companies again and as opposed to the Silicon Valley or where anywhere in the world you could be well uh, you know I believe I, I really a big believer of, of South Carolina and uh, and the potential that this state has got and uh, I always felt that uh, whatever happened with Silicon Valley, which was not by accident, but it was by determination, uh, could happen in South Carolina. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, moved to uh, and started companies in Silicon Valley because of Stanford and because Frederick Turman, who was the dean engineer, sure. uh, of engineering many years ago, uh, but also attracted by uh, a nice state a place that at the time was not as crowded as it is today, where things could happen and there were people who wanted to make them happen. And you know, South Carolina has got a lot of the same characteristics, okay? We've got some uh, fabulous uh, uh, learning uh, institutions here. Uh, we've got a beautiful place where to have people. We've got a very strong work ethics. So to me, the idea was, uh, you know, you, you got to start and set some example, build some success, and then when people realize that it's possible, then, uh, you know, they, they'll start to do something. Uh, so for their, in part for this reason, o Ometric was started in 2005. 
a metric took a, a, an optical technology from University of South Carolina and developed it into a product and commercialized it and it was an analytical product that uh, addressed uh, uh, process control issues in many different uh, industries. And Ometric eventually after five years was successfully sold to a Fortune 100 company. So that was a clear example. Yeah. That you can get things done here and very successfully. Uh, now I'm, I'm helping another startup or quasi startup one and a half years uh, uh, old company in uh, Greenville, which is in the cloud business. Uh, I'm also starting up a company which deals with, the th th or helping to start the company, which is dealing with 3D printing business. So I, I believe there are a lot of opportunities in this state. What is it that keeps South Carolina from becoming, as you say, that Silicon Valley? I mean, why, why? We, we have been talking about sort of the new south for a long time and it hadn't got here yet or is not as fully here as some of us would like what what do you think is holding us back i believe that uh, uh you know events or or actually uh you know development as they happen in other places like the silicon valley first of all they they require a, a very strong leadership um, you know, once again, if you identify uh, Frederick Turman as the, the father of Silicon Valley, uh, he found himself in, in this uh, cathedral in the desert because Stanford, that's what right. it was. It was in the middle of nowhere. And he started to go and reach out and bring in people and changing uh, the university uh, uh, traits from being, you know, a teaching institution to be an institution that was cooperating and actually helping the startups and so on. So it took a lot of, it took the three C's, you know, creativity, cooperation, communication to get that done. And so uh, and you, you need that leadership. I, I feel that sometimes, uh, you know, we don't have the kind of leadership here. We tend to be a little also too fragmented uh, I believe we should have a regional and state interest at heart rather than the Greenville, the Columbia, and the Charleston interest. So uh, we should really avoid that fragmentation, which is uh, not in our own interest. And, uh, and then you've you got other things that will develop. For instance, clearly, you don't have a culture of speed. Uh, <laughs> we do not have a culture of speed. Uh, that, that, is, that is the understatement of this whole series. <laughs> By the way, it's very attractive when you look at the leisure or the living area, uh, you know, living in South right. Carolina. However, today in any business in, in which you are, you have right. to be very fast. I mean, that's really right. the basic competitive advantage or, or, or weapon that you have. And the other thing, we, I don't think that we have a big culture of risk taking. Uh, you know, it is uh, very common in, uh, in areas like Silicon Valley, you start up a little company and people will jump ship from big companies, you know, with all the benefits, all the cushions that they have uh, and, and jump in and take risks because they believe that if that works, you know, it will make a big difference in their life. Uh, in South Carolina, this culture of risk of really trying hard, uh, I don't think it's as widespread uh, or probably, you know, limited to fewer people. You know, it's interesting you talk about the culture of risk taking because if you look at the earliest days of South Carolina when it was, uh, when it was a colony and it became so rich and so powerful, they took huge risks. Absolutely. And then, in one sense, the Civil War was, again, another huge risk. But, but we've gone from this radical risk-taking to, to virtually none at all. I hadn't really thought about that, but that's, that's true. We, we, you don't think of this place as, as a bunch of risk-takers. And, you know, as in many other places, risk-taking, uh, you know, goes, belongs to a certain generation and then you skip some generations before it comes back yeah. uh, because probably they're living comfortably after what was produced before. One of your fellow Italians that, that we've talked about, Romano Prodi, he said something to me one time. He said, 
Neither a country nor a family can be both rich and stupid for three generations. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> and and I, I wonder sometime if we, I don't know that we have been rich, but we have been stupid on occasion. But um, I, I'm I'm fascinated. You you and I've had a number of conversations, and you know there there are some people who are who are very political, some people who are non-political, and you are perhaps the most anti-political person I have ever known. And, and, and talk about a, a little bit about your perspective on government in, in general, but coming from your Italian roots, but also South Carolina government. And I know you don't participate in, in some ways because of the system, but it, it strikes me you're so engaged in the life and culture and business of our, city, of our state and it's such a boost of it, but the politics is so repellent to you and I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Why, why is that? T talk a little bit about that. Probably it's been my upbringing in Italy <laughs> where politics really is, uh, is very interesting, I would say. Uh, I, I think I've always been a big believer of either you lead or you follow or you get out of the way, okay? And uh, I, I think that uh, the, there are opportunities in, in government to lead. Uh, and, uh, you know, in my last 20 years in, in, in uh, South Carolina, uh, you know, I saw some. And when government leads and leads for really the good, uh, and the vision, you know, of, uh, of, of a better future for South Carolina. And things work because a lot of people coalesce under that vision and help doing it independently from their uh, political color. Uh, but the issue is that uh, when uh, there is not that vision, and so at that point, government gets in the way. Right. It's as simple as that. And when government gets in the way, then, uh, you know, it does uh, more bad than good. And, uh, and so that, that's a little bit of my <laughs> resentment <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, politics obviously can, uh, uh, can help a lot in, in getting things accomplished, but uh, they can also be a serious obstacle to getting things accomplished. But, but it's, that, but it's that, uh, that, that vision and the leadership that, that is lacking that sort of discourages you from being involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, are, there, are there political people uh, that you admire? Political people? People that you admire? Political, that's a load of question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm putting you on the spot here. We're in front of the television. I'm asking you all these questions you never answer when we're sitting around having a beer. <laughs> you know, I, I came uh, uh, in the United States uh, early 1980. And at that point, obviously, and once again, I'm apolitical, so I'm not saying sure. this motivated by, by color or, or party uh, affiliation. Uh, but I saw a country going through uh, a change from uh, uh, the time in which Jimmy Carter was president to when Ronald Reagan was president. And, and uh, I came to a country that was uh, uh, really demotivated, uh, you know, because of the problems that right. there were, to a rebuilding of, uh, uh, you know, the optimism, uh, okay, in what we can do and accomplishing a lot of things. And so to me, that was a, a going back to the America that was my dream in, right. in terms of its values. Um, I saw, uh, uh, you know, other people. Uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, President Bill Clinton, who, uh, you know, really was uh, a president at the time of extraordinary economic growth and boom, and, and, and try also to keep an even keel in, uh, in uh, foreign relations and not, you know, getting America involved in the wars and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, I think some, uh, I definitely I saw some people admire here locally. Uh, Carol Campbell, I believe uh, he had a vision, he had leadership, and he did a lot of right. good things. Uh, I've been also an admirer and a friend of Governor Bob McNair. Uh, and, and so I, I believe that there is a lot of uh, people here who, who can get things accomplished. Uh, we need that leadership, though. T talk about, it. assume for the moment you're on, on a plane flying 
back from, to or from Italy, and I assume that you're sitting in the front of the plane and not in the back of the plane, uh, and so you're because I'm a pilot. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but but you but you find yourself sitting next to a, a European businessman that's thinking about trying to make an investment somewhere in the world. What what would you tell him uh, as to why he should come to South Carolina? Well, exactly the reasons why I came to South Carolina. Uh, uh, you know, if first of all, it depending on what investment it is, but uh, uh, we clearly have uh, a very uh, strong uh, expertise in manufacturing, and and you know, manufacturing was seen in the past as a way of creating jobs. Uh, I think that now we should look at manufacturing as really an expertise and a competitive leverage that companies can have, even if today produces uh, you know, fewer jobs because of automation. Right. Uh, we have tremendous work ethics. Um, uh, you know, that, that has been, I, I had plans, plants, manufacturing plants all over the world, and uh, South Carolina was an extremely bright spot. Uh, then we have a system, uh, we have an infrastructure that really can help a company. For instance, we have the tech colleges infrastructure, which is absolutely tremendous, I mean. And, and it helped us to get trained people and, uh, and, and really, you know, uh, uh, customize, if you want, the training uh, to our needs. And, and once again, as I said before, uh, you have a lot of people uh, who want you to be successful here. And so that they could help. Uh, you know, sometimes it takes just a few phone calls and, and people we try to solve a problem, make sure that uh, you know, your company can move on without red tape or without things like those. And, and plus you've got a beautiful place where to attract people. You know? So these, in my opinion, are, are really the, the elements of why people should do business here. And I tell you what I've seen in the last 20 years, you get a lot of people moved to South Carolina uh, because of their companies moved. And in the, begin, in the beginning, they might not have been very happy about that, but then they stay. They say, yeah. They stay. There's a lot, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if, suppose you woke up tomorrow and the, the people of South Carolina, in their infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to make you king of South Carolina, <laughs> and they said, and they picked you up and took you and installed you in the capital and said, you are King Walter the First, and we are your loyal subjects. What would you have us do? What, what would you do? Free grits are in the package. Free grits, okay. free grits, <laughs> yeah, you, get, you get free grits. But beyond the grits, <coughs> well, what, what would you have us do? That's difficult to say because uh, even if I've been uh, CEO of several companies, uh, that it ain't the same as being king. No, <laughs> and that, no it's not the same. That position would scare me. Uh, because as CEO, you got to do a lot of things, obviously, by consensus and by leadership. But, uh, uh, you know, we have... Uh, a lot of strengths, okay? Uh, we have clearly extremely good, uh, uh, what I would call learning institution, of hopefully much more than teaching or educating institutions, in Charleston, in Columbia, South Carolina, in uh, Greenville. Uh, and, uh, you know, those do a wonderful job. However, uh, I think that uh, we should once again try to see what are the needs you know, in order to, to grow and how they should adapt. One of the things that going back to Terman at Stanford, he did very well, was to start this honors or cooperative program in which they would take full-time employees and get them to do degrees at, at their universities, you know, like right. at Stanford and others, so to, to improve their skills and, and their education. And so it, it takes that creativity, say, okay, that, you know, Stanford has been working this way like all academic institutions, but now all of a sudden we do 180 degrees and we go and really help these people in a very productive way. Uh, so these are the kind of things that should happen uh, with that part. Uh, obviously, the tax system is really wonderful from that standpoint. And, and I think that uh, they, they will play uh, a more important role in the future as I think that the world is moving more towards 
practical type of learning and education rather than academic type of, of learning and education. I think another interesting area to me is uh, uh, manufacturing. Uh, we always had the perception of manufacturing as just as manufacturing. On the other side, uh, uh, if you take the, 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 the textile industry that has been really big in South Carolina, right. so we, you got a tremendous knowledge about textiles. And then you got an artistic uh, environment, particularly in Charleston, South Carolina. So how, why the two things never came together to form a fashion industry? You know, that's really interesting. We, 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 we turn out t-shirts, but not fashion. Exactly right. And, and look at what the fashion industry does for a country like Italy, for exactly. instance, okay? Yeah. And that's basically that coming together of art and knowledge of what you can do with those textiles, you know, and, and what kind of things you produce. Now, going forward, this is going to be uh, applicable to many other industries because, for instance, in, in uh, uh, you know, with the advent of 3D printing, now uh, you can have creativity unleashed completely and people coming up with ideas and, and getting product made that it was unthinkable before. You know, the, the world rewards creativity and, and the more we go on and, and the more it will be so. And so that, that's another way we've got to stimulate creativity, we've got to stimulate cooperation, and then see how this thing together can really uh, lead to more development in the States. How do, you, how do you spur creativity? I mean, you don't, you, you don't think of the South other than literature as being a creative place. And how do you create well, I, I think that there are a lot of creative people, and uh, I believe that uh, probably in the past we have relied upon creativity as a birth gift that a person is. But I believe that creativity can be taught because, and, and actually uh, my personal opinion is that we do the opposite. We stifle creativity, particularly in, in small kids, <coughs> you know, going through their education. Because to some point, you know, you want to regiment them, and uh, and uh, and so you you actually stifle creativity. If uh, the educational system uh, would have helped me in my dreams when I was a little kid, I would have been the next Werner von Braun by now. Because rocket science was really, you know, my favorite. But they did everything to stifle it. So, so I I believe that this can be taught. Uh, and, and so you can help people to develop a creative process. Uh, of course, uh, it has to start uh, with the learning institutions, which sometimes they don't seem to be right. very creative themselves and very compartmentalized to, you know, in their department the interest and yeah. things like those. So uh, mm -hmm. that's something that you can spur, I believe. You know, just thinking about what, what is required for creativity, is diversity. Lots of different people with different points of view and different attitudes and so on. And that, and because we have been in the South so divided by issues of race that sort of demand a, a regimented, stifled system, if you will, you know, maybe that had something to do. I mean, talk about how your perception of of race in South Carolina, having come from not only a sort of Italy where there wasn't the racial diversity, and then California and Pittsburgh, then here. What talk about that? Well, <laughs> I experience uh, uh, much more uh, racial uh, problems in Italy, north versus south, really? than yeah. in South Carolina. Okay. Really? Oh, absolutely. There, there's more. Racial division oh, yes. in Italy between, between north, and north and south than there is between black and yes. white yes. in yes. South Carolina. And there used to be, now it's better, but when I grew up, so yeah, in the 60s uh, through the 70s, uh, it was that way. Uh, so you, you go, we go to a city like Turin, uh, which was an industrial city, Fiat. Uh, it's right. always been there. And Fiat attracting people uh, to uh, immigrate from the southern part of Italy. 
and uh, you would have a clash, which was really racist. Uh, when I moved to Turin in uh, <coughs> 73, uh, I was rented an apartment in a house, and uh, the first thing, uh, the way in which uh, the, the owner of the building would qualify people first was uh, they couldn't be southern than Florence. I barely qualified coming from Genoa. So, yeah, you don't realize that, but uh, there was a lot of that. And, and actually, uh, it was also my surprise when I came to South Carolina, because as an outsider, I, I frankly didn't see problems. I, I was treated with respect. Uh, I, I never personally made any difference of color of skin and so on, but <clears throat> uh, I've been treating people with respect, they've been treating me with respect, and uh, I, I thought the way of going that probably, I believe it has been a little bit unique even during the, 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 the civil rights era in South Carolina, probably less, uh, <coughs> less violent than, than in other states of the yeah. United States. Uh, you know, to me, uh, I, I have a little problem here. I believe that in South Carolina we have this albatross on our back of, you know, the civil rights problems and stuff like that. And I believe that at some point we've got to remove this because you will never have racial progress if you continue to focus on racial issues, okay? Right. As far as I'm concerned, personally, they are none. So why don't we remove this albatross and really, you know, move on toward things that eventually, since they will create, uh, uh, you know, more education, more information, more exchange with our cultures, uh, better economic development, you know, they will become a multi-place eventually. Are you optimistic that we're doing that, that we're moving in the right direction? I, I believe that we could move faster once again if we don't focus too much on what was yeah. the past and we really focus on the future. Thinking about attracting international business as opposed to just domestic business, what does South Carolina, we, we do apparently a very good job in attracting international business, but how is that different than attracting a business from Pittsburgh? Uh, well, uh, obviously uh, there are many ways to do it, and, and I think that, uh, you know, South Carolina is that an outstanding job in really going out in the world and attracting some of the top companies that you can think of uh, to South Carolina. And uh, <coughs> I believe that also because of these companies here that attracted, and, and I know some companies that actually uh, from Pittsburgh they set up shop here, you know, to cater to some of the needs of the bigger players here. So, uh, and, and you know, if you are good at attracting international business, I think that it should be easier to attract uh, domestic business. So I believe that we have demonstrated already that we can do this, okay? We demonstrated, <coughs> and so we, we should continue to do that. Then there is also the issue of attracting people. We, uh, and, and I know specifically the case of USC, but I believe it's, it's uh, the same as for the other universities, we have a lot of uh, people who come to study in our universities from countries as far as China and, you know, and, and right. other countries. They come here, they study, and then they leave. So we have the ability to attract these people, obviously, but we have not developed the ability to retain them. Right. Okay, and that is another thing that a vibrant uh, startup or uh, culture, you know, and so on, would obviously be a big plus to, have, to be able to retain these people that we spend a lot of money to educate and then they leave. So they don't you right. know, produce anything in return here. So I believe that there are a lot of ways. Uh, once again, I think that we've got to think a little bit about the past, focus on the future, and be creative and, and, be, and work together. Envision South Carolina, work class and globally connected.